Welcome to another episode of Painted in Color. My name is Eric Wilkerson. I'm joined by my co-hosts, Lauren Brown and Mia Araujo. Today, we're gonna to be talking about conventions, your first convention to be specific. The hows, the whys, the what do you do? How do you pay for, how do you charge people? How do you make the art? How do you sell the art? How do you get people to come to your table? We're going to talk about all of that today, maybe a little bit at a, at a time. Um, I've been asked questions about how to start with your first convention a few times in my career. And uh, we can talk about our own experiences with our first conventions and what it was like, what we learned along the way. And um, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, I, uh, I can still remember my first convention like from 10 years ago and not knowing anything. <laughs> and I, I like remember how it felt. And so for anybody who might be watching who is thinking about starting tabling at a convention for the first time and selling your artwork, this is definitely a good place to begin. Um, you know, we're just going to give advice that we've picked up over the years of doing conventions. Um, but this is a big topic, so if it ends up like splitting out into multiple parts, uh, so be it. But um, starting out, like, how do you even determine like what to sell? Like, what do you even make for conventions, especially if you don't have a budget? So, uh, so let's get into that. Like, Eric or and Mia, whoever wants to answer, like, what was your first convention like? And, like, what did my, you bring? My first convention was Dragon Con. Hmm, I just leaped one. right in. <laughs> And um, I had heard good things and I figured, why not just, uh, you know, let's just do it and uh, skip, skip the local, the local stuff at the mall and just go straight to the, you know, the big leagues. So um, I had a table. Uh, I had all of my art flat on the table because that's how it was done back in the olden days. Uh, before everybody started propping it up um, but uh, people would walk by and they'd nod and they'd look and then they'd ask me if I had any Spider-Man prints or stuff like that when I clearly didn't but, <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was an interesting experience uh, I made I made some money won a couple of awards for my art how oh, awesome um, your first show yeah, my first show. That's awesome. Uh, what? I uh, dragon went to Dragon Con. I took home best alien, best horror, and overall third place in the art show behind uh, um, two other really big artists. I can't remember their names. I know their names, but I'm not going to say them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, we, we it was a good time. It was a really good time. And uh, I just, I, I wish that I wasn't so nervous mm. throughout the entire experience. Uh, I didn't know how to attract customers. I didn't know what to say to them. I didn't, I didn't know how to seal the deal, basically. You know, I had a lot of people come by and stare and nod, <laughs> but I didn't know how to sell myself or sell the art. Because people would ask me, what is the story behind this one? They really wanted to, because uh, I feel like a lot of convention goers, they are creative people, they're writers, they're whatever it is in their, in their daily life, but they want to have some kind of connection to what they're buying. And if you don't have a story, oh, well, it's just a, a book cover that I did. Oh, it's just some random painting that I did for fun, for funsies, and I printed it. And you want the print or not? right? That doesn't connect with them. But if you say, oh, well, this is part of a, a series of mermaid things that I'm doing. And, you know, you got to love it because it's mermaids. And they go, you know what? I do love mermaids. You take credit card and you go, yes. <laughs> but if you, you don't, you're not there yet, if this is your first thing, you're just spilling out your portfolio from college on a table and hoping that people respond to it. How do you what do you do? And a lot of it is trial and error. Um, my wife gave me a, uh, a receipt book for my first convention where 
I would write down the names of the things that sold, how much it sold for, so I could keep a tally, um, you know, and a carbon copy. So then I could go back in at the end of the day and count off and say, okay, well, which were my top selling prints? What was my top selling thing? Okay, got it. Well, for the next convention, I'm going to double down and bring more of that. You know, they didn't like the robots, but they liked the gory stuff, or they liked the robots, but they didn't like the gory stuff, or whatever. You know, every convention is going to be a little different depending on what state you're in. And that's even, that's even, that's something else. Yeah. You might do great. I did, I thought I did great in, in, in Atlanta, Georgia, but then I brought the same exact material to New York Comic Con and they could care less. Yeah. <laughs> really? But it was interesting. Oh. Well, how was what was your first convention like? Which one are you asking? Mia, Amia, what was yeah. your? Oh, um, mine was WonderCon in 2017, and um, I had been going to conventions for years just as an attendee, um, and d- didn't really think I, I. I mean, you know, I come from the gallery world, so uh, I didn't at first didn't really think there was crossover for my work there. It, it felt like, you know, most of them were comic conventions where people do fan art or do comic book characters. Um, but a few friends of mine from the galley world had crossed over into conventions and, and were like encouraging me to do it. Um, but I was broke at the time and I was on, in a ton of debt. So I actually, for my first show, ended up doing an Indiegogo campaign to raise funds for my equipment and my prints. Like I basically wanted to be able to afford to do the first show. And um, I was doing a lot of research too at the time. Like uh, because I'd been going to shows for several years, I would take pictures of people's booths and like look at my favorite ones and see what I liked about them. And, and the other thing I did is like, I reached out to people who were doing conventions successfully and asked them a bunch of questions, like where they got stuff or whatever. Uh, this is kind of what I do, okay? I like super overanalyze everything. <laughs> uh, but it's like, um, by the time I was at my first show, I had the banner, I had the, you know, prints facing up, you know, I knew to stand up and talk to people and engage. I did the thing you did where I was telling every print that sold uh, telling how much I made every day and comparing prices, like which was the slow day, which was the, you know, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, the Even just at the show, going on the floor and seeing what the good spots were to have a table, knowing that having a corner table is always good, like all that stuff, you know. Um, but again, it's like, I, I didn't do it through trial and error because I couldn't afford to, you know, I did not have the startup money. Um, and I was really lucky that a small group of people that really liked my work and supported me, like helped pitch in it was like 30 people or something that chipped in money to like help me get to my first convention um and then took the sales from that first show I think it was only 1200 bucks that I made but I put it into the next show and then the next show and uh just kind of put my profits from one show to the next and um I think 2017 I just did WonderCon which is here in Anaheim like local to me so I could drive there and the next show I did was Long Beach which is also local to me and then the next year I flew out to my first show out of state which is Emerald City Con in Seattle uh, roomed by myself because I didn't know enough artists there. Uh, so I got like a little Airbnb. I think that year I also did WonderCon again and did a third show. It was Gen Con. And that show I roomed with three other artists. So I split the room costs. So it's like every show is learning something, you know? Um, and then my last year, 2019, I did four shows. So each year was adding one more show somewhere else. And again, the thing I would recommend to people if it's your first time, do a lot of research about the show you're going to. Like like Eric said, depending on which state or what city you're going to, each show has its own flavor. It's the kind of art that they like, you know, that buyers like there. Um, it is expensive to do these shows. So to me, it just doesn't seem worth it to do the tiny shows unless you do a lot of them and you like, uh, you know, networking a lot or spending a lot of time. But for me, it's just like, it was just a lot of time invested in setting up for each show that I wanted to focus on the ones that had huge audiences like Dragon Con, Gen Con, you know, uh, Emerald City, because it, it, you're focusing your effort on the ones that will have the most bodies there, you know, that will see your work, you know? So um, anyway, I feel like I kind of rambled there for a bit, but that's that's kind of how I went about it. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. Uh, my first show um, was Otakon, actually. So it was another big convention. Um, I After I had attended Otakon for probably about, I think it was um, six years at that point as an attendee. And then I had a month's notice where one of my friends um, had uh, dropped out of tabling at Otakon. And this was like right after, um, I can't remember, I think right after I graduated grad school. Um, and 
I didn't, I've never done a convention before. Like I didn't have any merch ready, but I had a month's notice to prepare half a table's worth of work because I was going to split with somebody else and drive up from Savannah where I was going to school to uh, Baltimore, Maryland to, for Oticon. And so for this month, I grinded and hustled and just like made my print runs and made buttons and laminated my own bookmarks and like made like this original work for bookmarks. I remember making like a whole sketchbook page of like sushi Pokemon or whatever. I don't know what that was. I never sold it, but um, I just made merch that first off, like of fan art that I really, of, of things that I really loved. And then um, my original art as well. And just brought prints of illustrations I already had lying around. Some of them were like original characters that nobody was going to ever buy, but others were, you know, subject matter that might've been interesting enough, but I just like took everything and brought it with me, no experience. And um, I did make a small profit, but it was like, it was like $500. It was really nothing <laughs> at the time, but I felt like it was so much money back then because, you know, I'd never done it before. And I was at that point, so afraid of, of attending Oticon because it was so big. And I just didn't think I was ready until suddenly I was just like thrust into it. Um, but then from there, I started learning a lot about conventions and how to display my work and, um, you know, bought a bunch of materials to, um, you know, display vertically, because if you have things laying flat on your table, it's not going to be as, um, you know, seen by the crowd as something that's vertical and their eye level. So I started learning the different uh, rules about how to display things. Um, I think around that time, I also had a roommate who was doing conventions and her sister was doing conventions. So we got to kind of like compare knowledge and compare notes. Um, we shared like the vendors that we were using to print and ship things. Um, and so like, you know, the con game got better and better, but anime cons for me were always fairly middling. It wasn't until I got to the more gaming conventions, especially tabletop based conventions that I really realized that there was an audience that I didn't know was that that might work really catered to. Um, and so the tabletop gaming crowd was like the most attracted to the kind of work that I was doing. Uh, and now that I know that those are the kinds of conventions that I want to put more emphasis into attending, um, even though anime conventions, you know, still like my merchandise, but tabletop gaming, like the whole package. So it's interesting to learn, like Eric said, like what kind of audiences uh, buy your work differently, because I made about double of what I made at the average anime convention at somewhere like Gen Con, for example. So um, larger conventions were definitely good. So this year I'm going to Gen Con, Dragon Con, and um, an Acon in Dallas, which is an anime convention. So it's going to be interesting with like new merchandise to see how everything stacks up. But um, but yeah, it's been about uh, 10 years that I've been doing conventions. And um, yeah, each year I just like learn more and more, um, you know, like tracking sales and, uh, you know, being like treating myself like a business rather than just like a normal hobby and uh, as I get more professional it gets better for me to organize each year so yeah there's a lot of learnings <laughs> that I've picked up over the years so the the question might come up from anybody listening to this why why bother with conventions what's the big deal <clears throat> and I would say that the big deal is that you get to test the waters with your art you get to you get to show your art directly to a fan base, a potential fan base. Your audience is right there walking the aisles, potentially hundreds of thousands of people walking uh, around a convention hall for a four days, two, two to four days. And you get to see what pieces you've created have uh, any kind of emotional, get any kind of emotional reaction from someone. Somebody might be walking walking through a convention and they might stop cold from 20 feet away and and squint and look toward your direction and then walk a little closer and a little closer and then before you know it they're standing in front of your table going what's the story for this what's this about and then then it's then it's on you to pitch yourself then it's on you to tell this complete total stranger, this is why I painted this. This is why I designed this. It's so much fun for me. I had such a great time doing it. I'm so into designing and painting, whatever it is you love to do. And do you like the same thing? And they go, oh my God, yes. Oh my, my or uh, maybe not, but my daughter's really into it. I'm thinking about something for her for, as a gift. 
and you say, oh, that's such a nice, you're such a nice dad. That's, that'd be great. Well, uh, I do take credit card, <laughs> you know, <laughs> however you want to weave it in there that this is actually for sale. But um, it is a really good way to, to introduce yourself, get your work out there and introduce yourself to potential fans that might end up buying something from you later on down the line or from your online store if you have something like that set up. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I wanted to say is that for an illustrator working today, um, it is always really beneficial to have more than one stream of income. Yeah. And uh, there are many illustrators that, that, you know, they have their commissions that, that come in from various companies, but they also have an online store so they can sell their prints, their stickers, pins, whatever it is that they want to sell. They have Patreon accounts. Some do Kickstarters to promote their own art books or whatever it is they want to do. But there, for, for the longest time, have been conventions until, you know, right up until the pandemic, conventions were kind of the bread and butter for a number of people that we know that kind of said, you know what, I, I don't want to chase after the, con the, the commissions and chase after the big publishers. I want to go directly to an audience and say, here's what I got. And we're making pretty decent livings, you know, depending on what state they lived in, whatever their cost of living was. I mean, if I, I, we know people that rolled into a convention and came out four days later, 10 grand richer At or least more. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And so you say to yourself, well, wow, that's, that's quite a lot. And if you, and if you do four or five of those a year, that's, that's your income. Yeah. Right. So then anything else you do for the year is just extra. But having multiple streams of income is very important as a professional artist today. Um, some people bypass the convention route and they teach or they, you know, they they do other things. But it's always it always comes down to you have more than one company, more than one person paying your bills. So. Yeah, another thing too that I will say with conventions is that it's also a good ground to get new clients if you're looking for freelance clients, because I got about five people at Gen Con last time I went that like actually did hire me or wanted to hire me for jobs and I couldn't accept all of them because I was too busy. But um, it was, you know, it led to like one of my long term projects and a few of them like were just like have been published by now. And um, it's a great way to kind of like build lasting relationships with people like that, because then you have recurring work that is not just your convention, but somebody who wants your work and wants to hire you over and over again. Um, but I wanted to go back to something you said, because you were, you were talking about how you love talking about your work and love pitching yourself and like love showing, sharing your idea and why you loved it. Um, when you were saying that, I could also hear the sounds of many introverts shriveling up into their shells and being like, no, I don't want to talk to people. So, <laughs> so yeah. How do you handle a convention if you are really introverted, which I know a lot of us artists are. I'm an introvert, for example. I'm like, you know, more of an ambivert, so I'm not as averse to talking to people. But sometimes the idea of putting yourself out there in public like that to potentially thousands of people can be a scary co concept. So how do you get over that barrier of entry? And Mia, like I know that you, um, you're also introverted, like I am. So I'm curious to hear from you, like, well, how have you handled that before? Oh my gosh, that's actually a really great point that you're bringing up because uh, I think that it can be really overwhelming for the first time because I think a lot of the times when we put our work up online, you don't see people rejecting it. You just see people liking it. You know what I mean? Like, and sometimes even if that's a small number, it still feels better than the visceral reaction you get from people in person, literally looking at your stuff, making eye contact, walking on. It, may, it made no impact whatsoever. And I could see how for a newbie that could be really like demoralizing in some ways, you know? Um, or even just the, the positive version where somebody does connect with your work and comes up to you and gets really excited and you kind of can't match that energy and you don't, you know, like all that stuff. It's, it's a lot of overwhelming emotions. I think that if you're not used to it, it could be really, um, I mean, even if you are used to it, I think conventions are very draining, like emotionally, they just oh, yeah. are because it's like three days, eight hours or something like that every day that you're on the floor, usually on your feet 
with a smile on your face. You know, you can't, if you're feeling like crap, you can't really show it. You have to be a good salesperson, you know, and it's, it's very emotionally draining to do that. So I think it's just good to go in prepared, but, but something that really helped me is that I would always had somebody at the table with me whenever I could, you know, um, like my sister was actually my assistant at my first show and it was really fun. Like we got to hang out during the, the slow parts of the day. And, uh, there were times where it's like she would sort of talk up my work so that I didn't have to do it all the time. So you kind of trade off, you know? So if you can, if you do have friends that are willing to do it, or, uh, you know, I was actually lucky one show, there was an artist that wanted to learn how to do conventions. So she offered to do, to work my show, my booth for free in exchange for, I paid for all her gas and food and stuff like that. And she got to ask me any questions, you know, uh, get knowledge basically of how to do this. Um, but basically if you can't afford to get an assistant, either pay them or have someone like, work for you, like for knowledge, um, or have a friend, it definitely helps take a lot of the edge off of, um, the nerves involved. But, um, but I think just like everything, it's practice and, uh, it did help that I had a serving background. So I was used to talking to strangers, but if you don't have that, um, and you have like a really rocky first show, just know that over time, if this is something you really want to do, you'll just get better at it just by doing it. Um, so if it's something that you want to get better at, I wouldn't shy away from it because it terrifies you. I would just lean into it and do it, reach out to people, you know, for their advice, but, um, just kind of like push through and, and get better with each show, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's just a little bit at a time because yeah. if you're, if you're passionate about what you're creating, you're not trying to sell random X-Men prints or something like that. If it's not something you care about, you're bringing stuff that you care about to a yeah. convention. Mm -hmm. You're trying to put your best work out there because you want people to care enough to give you money for it, right? Basically. So if they ask you, what, what is this all about? Why did you paint this? Then it shouldn't feel like a painful thing or a, 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 a scary thing to just say, well, I really love mechas. I really love fantasy art i really love lord of the rings and i just wanted to just spill it all out here for you right um if 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 you're trying to push student work from college that you didn't really care about but you just think hopefully somebody might like it and somebody asks you what was this for and you say oh well it was a student it was a an assignment for my class that's not going to make a sale like nobody, like you don't care, <laughs> then they don't care, then they're just gonna go, okay, that's cool. And then they're gonna check their watch and walk away. You just, it's a snowball effect. So the more you start to talk and feel more comfortable uh, speaking about the thing you're passionate about, the more comfortable you'll be. And you just have to also remember, you may never see these people again in life. So just, <laughs> just keep that thought. Okay, well, I can just be myself just for five minutes, mm -hmm. just long enough to get that sale. And then I can relax because they've gone away. <laughs> they <laughs> took the art with them. I can relax. Everything's good. <laughs> they didn't yell at me. I'm cool. But um, for an introvert, for anybody that is not, if you, let's just say, let's just talk about if you're, when you're not making sales, because it's, it, it is an eight hour day. Yeah. Oh yeah. And it's not always money, 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 money every single hour. There might be a half hour, an hour, an hour and a half where you're just sitting there going, oh my God, this was the wrong choice. Yeah. And you get stuck in your head going, I could be home painting right now. And I'm sitting here watching the guy across from me and his cosplay girlfriend, like making cash money like non-stop like what am i doing wrong do they not like my x-men prints like what's going on and then all of a sudden it only takes one person to go mommy look <laughs> or there's some <laughs> fan to come by and go oh my god you painted all the x-men let me i'll be right back i gotta get my wallet then then your whole day has changed <laughs> then once you make that once you make that sale then it goes back to <laughs> Come back. It's an emotional roller coaster. Yeah. <laughs> it, is it is an emotional it, roller coaster. It and really it is, is, like you said, it's an it's an exhausting emotional roller coaster. When you say, well, that makes it sound so fun, Eric. Why I should just <laughs> sign up right now and do that. <laughs> but it's at the end of that four-day experience, you've gone through your highs and lows. But ultimately, if you've come away successful, then it's like, wow, that wasn't bad. Yeah. 
that wasn't and think, bad. Yeah, and I think there's some, you know, sometimes you do have an abysmal convention. Like I know, um, you know, a lot of people who sometimes come away with a loss and um, they were just like, oh, like, I don't know what happened. So I think something that's important too is that you know your audience and you know what kind of work you're selling is going to actually cater to the attendees at the convention. So if you're going to an anime convention and you have like, you know, um, like certain paintings that are completely off the subject matter, you know, that may not be your target audience or maybe they'll love it, who knows? You can definitely try, but it's good to kind of scout out your competition and see what people are selling, not to emulate what they're doing, but just to get a general sense of what people respond to versus what people don't respond to. It's just a good business tactic to do. Um, if you can, if you have a chance to even scout out a convention before you go, which you won't always, but it will help. Um, another thing too, is I know there's a lot of people who do prints for conventions or do certain merchandise for a certain convention that they're not really into and that they're only trying to do it to cater to that audience specifically, even though they're not a part of the audience. And oftentimes people can see that lack of passion and be turned off by it because they can tell that you're just trying to make art to fill, fulfill a criteria. And I think the better approach is to make art that you really feel proud of and, and happy to create. Uh, and like, you know, so that you can not only feel proud of what you made, but that people can see the passion and that you can talk to that piece of art. Uh, and I think that will provide better sales for you. Um, and also knowing how best to sell your art because not everybody sells prints very well. Sometimes people sell, you know, charms or enamel pins or bookmarks or buttons better. And, um, you know, it's like you have to figure out how your work best displays itself. So, um, you know, it's important to think about all those things, too, because I can't guarantee that you're going to have a successful con every single time. But at least knowing your audience and knowing what kinds of things you're going to sell and how to display your work is really going to help you have a successful convention. Yeah. And I think starting small, like with, that's what I did yes. at first. I just had prints because that's already kind of an investment. Like I said, I didn't have any startup money, so I had to raise it. So I just really concentrated on prints and originals uh, that I had in a portfolio. And then the next show I tried out, I don't know, like little zip up bags or something. Like I would try one piece of merch each show or to see how it did. One, one show I did enamel pins and those did really well. And it's just like you test out a new product each time because mm -hmm. some people's art, you know, just isn't merchandisable and that's okay. It just means you would just pivot and do it in a different way. Yeah. Um, or like, just because you see somebody selling uh, like I actually tried those like tapestry banners that a few artists were doing and I think I only sold ever sold one but luckily I only brought like two versions of it I did not ever invest a ton of money on inventory that was untested I would be very very you know uh, I would nervously try stuff out in the sense that expecting it to fail and try it like try to really sell it at the show and see how it did um, and, and a lot of it is it's good to try stuff out but at the same time I just wouldn't assume just because somebody else really sells enamel pins really well that you necessarily will because yeah. your art is different and so um it is just a lot about gosh like just hearing us talk about this like you really have to be great at being a salesperson really good at merchandising at branding at graphic design and making art <laughs> that's meaningful and connects with people it's a lot of skills yeah. and I'm not saying that to overwhelm people but I'm just saying don't be upset if your first show isn't like the show that you make 10K at or whatever. It's okay if you make just, like you said, 500 bucks your first show. That's actually really good. You made money. You didn't lose money, you know? Yeah. So it's just like, I would just take each show as a way to learn more about yourself and your brand and your art and your audience. Because what you were saying about the advantages of going to shows, I feel like still, even with social media and how you can go viral online, nothing quite replaces meeting people in person. And it's true it's so much harder to sell art like online unless you've met someone or somebody has seen your art in person. Like there's something about that, like seeing the art face to face that is more memorable to people than seeing it on their phone, you know? Yeah, because people in person have that, like that idea that they are here to buy something. If they've walked into Artist Alley, they've come in there with an intent mm -hmm. and they are prepared to spend money. So they are more likely to buy things that are that they see right in front of them in person rather than them going online and having infinite options to look at. Um, if they see something that catches them in that moment, they're probably going to be inclined to buy it. Uh, so the sales are way better than they are online. On the contrary, on the, con on the converse of that, sometimes merch that sells really well online won't sell well in person and vice versa. And I've definitely seen this ph phenomenon for sure. Like my prints do not really sell that well online, but there are certain things that do sell really well online. And like, 
I have like zipper zipper pouches um, that like almost never sell online, but in person, they're usually sold out by the second day. Like they're all gone. And so sometimes like, again, like people enjoy touching and feeling certain things too. So if you have smaller merchandise that people can pick up and experience, then that's more likely you're going to get a sale. I think there's a, stat, a statistic about that. If they touch it, they're more yeah. likely to buy it. Yeah. So, um, you know, like there's certain, again, certain venues will sell your work better. So that's why you have to diversify your income and try to display your work in different areas so that you have a better likelihood of getting rid of that merch rather than having to hold on to it for a long time. Um, also the point Mia that you brought up about the quantity is a really, really good point because so many people, when they start out, print like a hundred prints of one thing. Yeah. That's a lot to store if it doesn't sell. <laughs> and it's a lot of money up front. <laughs> yeah, that too. Yeah. <laughs> I had a student ask me that recently, like how many, how many of each image should I bring? And I said, no more than 10 to 12, mm -hmm. just just as a start, yep. because if you go, if you go buck wild and you're like, I'm bringing 50 prints and you sell two. <laughs> you're stuck with 48 prints. <laughs> and that paper heavy. is heavy. If you're, <laughs> yeah. If you're shipping or traveling, you have to carry that shit like, or some, or pay for it to go there. And that's a yeah. lot. It's a lot. Uh, as, as actually better to sell out of an image at a show and put up a little sold out sign that brings people in and makes them want to buy other things, you know? Yeah. And, in my last shows, I was actually taking pre-orders for the ones that would sell out and be like, if you buy it, if you pay for it now, I'll ship it to you for free. Um, and that would mostly get people to buy it. So yeah, doing the pre-orders really, um, it, it paid big dividends. I think I made like at least an extra thousand from doing pre-orders at Gen Con. Um, and I didn't even have that idea until I think it was, it was either you or Andrew who suggested it, but, um, I put everything up that would sell. I kept one piece of each merchandise and, and whoever bought it, I was like, can I hold on to this until the end of like Sunday? And they're like, yeah, like I'll be around. So I would hold on to the piece of merch, put the sold out sign on it so they could see what it was that was sold out exactly. and then do pre-orders for that piece of merch so that you could take down their address, take down their number, make sure you have multiple ways to contact them because yeah. you, you can and will miswrite something. Yeah. Uh, so get their um, you know address, their phone number and their email. Um, and make sure that like it works before they leave the table. <laughs> it's very yeah. important. Yeah. Wow. I should do that. Even know, knowing full well that I got it under the table. <laughs> <laughs> Why though? Then you have to take that stuff back. Get rid of it. <laughs> Get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, it's just, that's brilliant. But yeah, but if I don't want to bring the merch. Oh, right. <laughs> just bring, like, just true. pretend it's all sold out. Yeah, You're like, I mean, well, you should have been here when this door is open. It's right. all sold out. <laughs> right. You see that wave of people running down the hall? That was to me. That's hilarious, Eric. I mean, it's so, your whole table's like, Mark sold out, but I'm taking free orders. <laughs> free orders. It's all about it. I just got a book bag of stuff. Just unload the book bag. <laughs> That's oh so my cool. goodness yeah because like you sometimes you do have to limit the amount of merch you bring depending on if you have to travel for a convention because yeah. if you can't afford to ship everything to you because that's expensive uh you can't fit it all in your 50 pound suitcase so you have to pick and choose like what's your most popular merch or how much to bring that's really um you know it's always a tricky situation but then doing the pre-orders can make up for if you have to bring a limited amount of stuff um so that's also uh, a benefit for that too yeah but I think we've gotten ahead of ourselves. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is stuff that you worry about, like when you're in it, like, yeah, in yeah, it, yeah. In it. That's true. Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, like again, entering conventions, like, am I ready for conventions? We talked about that. How do I do it? If I'm an introvert, we talked about that. Um, other merchandise to bring aside from prints though, like what kinds of things can you create on a low budget? Cause when I started out, I was a student and students, don't have any money. I don't know if you know that, but we're poor. So <laughs> I had like maybe $200 to, to rub together, like at least to so like, at, or at most to prepare um, my merchandise with. And I was lucky enough to have, to be in an art school where I had friends with I like, you know, a button maker and a laminator. But if you don't have all that, like how, like, where do you get, even get prints made? How do you prepare your merch? What do you even bring for that first convention? So I think we talked a little bit about it, but we can go into more detail about what do you, what kind of stuff do you show if you have little to no money? And Mia, since you said directly that you, you know, you had to do a GoFundMe to do it, uh, what did you do in a low budget? 
I mean, I had more than $200 that I raised, but, um, mm-hmm. but, but I knew I wanted to do a sketchbook. Uh, so I did a little 28 page sketchbook, but even that to print, I think I printed a hundred of them. Cause that was the minimum order. Mm-hmm. It cost about like 200 bucks for that alone. So that's not always cheap, but I know some people in the past used to do zines that were black and white, but I wanted them to flip through and get a lot of art in something that costs like 15 bucks, you know? Um, there's always there, I think that's always a good idea to have any kind of sketchbook or something where somebody could just for the price of a print get a lot of art, but I didn't want it to be any of the art that I was making as prints. So if they wanted those images, they'd have to buy the print. So I did prints, sketchbook, and uh, like I said, I had original drawings just in a portfolio that didn't take up a lot of space. And I think those are pretty much the only three things I had the first show. Um, it's, you know, I guess a good variety, but um, stickers are also cheap and I've always yes. thought, uh, that's always good even just to be like you get a free sticker with an order or something like that just to like you can't get the sticker unless you buy something because some people will buy the cheapest thing at your table that's like less than five bucks well that's 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 what I was about, just about to say is there's the high there, there's the premium high priced uh products the 25 dollar and up things the prints the play mats the mouse pads whatever but then if you are all if you're offering and I like the that you said that the sketchbook had stuff that wasn't anywhere else on the table yep. yeah. because there are some cheapos out there that'll just go, Oh, well, I could get this sketchbook. Cause it's got the same exact thing you want $25 mm-hmm. for. Yeah. And I got five bucks in my pocket. Peace. <laughs> right? yeah. And then you thought you thought you were bringing, being, being genius, having a, this wide assortment, but then yeah. you're like, wait, I'm I'm just selling out a little five dollar things. Yeah. Oh man! This is why I stopped doing mini prints for the same things that were bigger prints on my table because people yeah. would go for the mini prints and like I would have to hold on to the big ones. Yeah. It's they're they're directly competing with each other and the cheaper one is usually going to win out. Yeah, I would do the same thing for postcard sets. That was the other thing I did. I just got a bunch of postcards from Vista Print or whatever of different images and just put them together into a pack that was the same price as one print. But again, none of those images were available in any other size. And people yep. would always ask, can I get this one as a bigger one? Or can I get this one in that set? And I'm like, nope, you have to buy it separate. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's right. <laughs> now, for anybody that wants to do a sketchbook, a little black and white sketchbook, that's something that you can create yourself, print it out eight and a half by 11, fold it, take it to like an office depot or some office supply store, show them how you want it printed front and back. And they will do that and staple it together. Yep. And you can get a whole box of that, um, you know, in a day, really, and and have it ready to go. Put it up, put a couple of them at a time on your table. Um, but I wanted to actually bring up the fact that I had also been doing, I had also been looking online for like photos of people's uh, setups at mm-hmm. conventions before I started doing it. And even after I started doing it, try to always trying to level up. How can I promote myself? How can I make my, my setup look even more professional? Yeah. And I remember seeing yours, Mia, I, we had never met. I remember just, I messaged you on Facebook. I'm thinking, I hope please respond because I, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know if you were going to or not, but I was like, oh man, I hope she responds because her setup looks so good. I got to know where she got all of this stuff. And it's funny to hear you talk about that now. Like you had to do this GoFundMe and you like, you were looking at other stuff too. Mm-hmm. And because I saw you had your banner, which looked amazing. Mm-hmm. Then you had your, your table, everything was all professionally propped up and the black tablecloth and then you had some kind of shelving behind it with your your little mini paintings. And I'm like, damn, this is this is solid. I gotta like I I feel like I'm gonna feel like I'm like preparing for a yard sale compared to that. Like, oh man. So I I messaged you and had to ask where how did you where did you do? I don't like, oh my God. So um oh uh-oh. yeah, oh, there. There you go. oh man, what show is that? Uh, I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> oh, I think that might be Denver. That was the one show where I tried those weird side panels that uh, to hang up more stuff because I couldn't, I actually couldn't hang up art behind me there. So yeah, that's the thing when you're flying and you can't bring a backdrop that is sturdy enough to hold art. Like some people get those pro panels, like I could never afford those. 
So shows like Gen Con that provide pro panels, what those are is like they're sturdy walls that you can hang framed art on. These ones are just literally just almost like a photography pole behind me and just yeah. draped, yeah. Uh, just draped fabric on it with my banner. So I couldn't hang any of that art that's like up. Um, so yeah, for each show, you have to improvise like how to change your setup based on what the limitations are, what they don't provide, but yeah. There's so for for people that don't understand what they were looking at, there's there you could you can there are walls that are already pre-made or you can get you'd have to order it online, but there are uh, photography poles. There's it's basically two tripods with a pole in the center that's like mounted to the top that are used for um, backdrops, mm -hmm. photography backdrops. Mm -hmm. So you would just take your your black tarp curtain, whatever it is that you get and just throw it over that and clamp it. Mm -hmm. And so now you have a, a solid black wall behind you. Well, not solid, but it's a curtain behind you, but it just looks a little bit more professional than just seeing the entire convention behind you as you're trying to make a sale. Yeah. Um, you know, you yeah. could, there are other people, depending on the amount of space that you might have at a convention, because sometimes they pack you in depending on the amount of space between tables, you could also have a, a six foot, seven foot banner that like retractable banner yeah. um, that you put up as well. If you don't want to have a, a kind of curtain banner uh, hanging above you, but um, the presentation is, is important and how you, I, I'm, I'm on the fence on whether or not to show the prices for my for the stuff I'm selling really um because from my experience I've seen people it'll catch their eye whatever the image is might catch their eye and then then I see their eye go to the price and they go mm -hmm. you see that in turn that conflict <laughs> going on in their head they're like they're debating it and you go oh man, I, maybe I should have made that $5 cheaper, right? Then, then there's that internal conflict in your head and you go, oh man. So then they walk away. Hmm. So I did that at a couple of conventions and then halfway, maybe maybe an hour or two into the first day, I just ripped stickers off of everything on my table. Interesting. And uh, when people would stop by my table and look, then they had to ask, how much is this? Now I've got them. And I can say, oh, well, like what caught your eye? I can say, well, what caught your eye? Oh, this piece with this woman is really beautiful. And I say, well, thank you so much. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about it, blah, 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 blah. By the time you've conveyed how important and what this means to you, what, what the story is, then 25, 35, 40 bucks is not that big a deal to them mm -hmm. but if they don't know anything about it they're just looking at it off face value and they go is that really worth 40 bucks I interesting know. i think I the always... the... oh sorry go ahead oh go on mia i was just gonna say if it's like really busy though you would not have time to talk to everyone to make that sale though and i think when it's really like busy there's some people lining up already seeing the price the prices and already have their money ready and are ready to pay and you might not have time to do the spiel, unfortunately. Sometimes, sometimes I speak loud. Okay. <laughs> so, so you know how to project. I can't really do that. I think bass projects more easily. Yeah. Well, I mean, I so I, <laughs> I never thought about that. It's true. But I I used to be really shy about it, but now I when I see I'm talking to one person and he's got his wallet in his hand or she's got her wallet, and we're talking and. I'm making that sale. She's handing me the card and I'm doing my square reader and I see other people. I'm making eye contact with the next person. And I'm like, yeah, and I had such a great time painting this. It was so much fun and blah, blah, blah. I got a whole series of these things coming. You just got to follow my website and oh, the, the banner's right here. It's got the Instagram. You should follow me. I'm like look, making sure, oh my God, I'm in full circus mode. <laughs> full, circus. <laughs> full circus mode. But it's, it's, I've, I, but I've done it enough times now where I can flow like yeah. that. Yeah. But not everybody can time, start that way. Not, not everybody's going to start that way, but by taking those prices off of your stuff, by not putting the price tag on your stuff, you are encouraging conversation with those, those first time buyers where 
they don't have to have that internal conflict or debate and you don't have to go, but wait, come back. Oh, I can, I can give you a deal. You know, you don't have to have that kind of moment. They can come up and talk to you. You can talk to them and you can practice how to sell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's, it's definitely good to understand how to talk to your work, like how to talk about your work and talk to your work. Um, and, you know, like have people, like get people drawn in. Um, another tactic that I usually like to do as a way to like ease people into my table, because, you know, like as we are shy sometimes, sometimes the people who are approaching your table are also shy. So you want to provide a warm, welcoming kind of uh, environment for them to come into. So letting them know that you are paying attention, making eye contact, you know, gently, like don't stare at them, but just like, let them know that you've seen them. Because if you're like heads down drawing at your booth, or like, if you're, you know, like not paying attention or eating, people are not inclined to bother you. So make yourself as available as possible in order to draw people in. And usually what I like to do is I like to observe what they're wearing, because usually when they're at a convention, you're wearing something that you are a fan of, and you want to display that. And so notice that thing. Notice that thing. And if you know about it, talk about it and say, hey, I like that necklace you're wearing. I love Spirited Away too. And you can have a conversation also about that. And then that leads them in to look around. Like I always can track the exact moment where they look at me and then their eyes travel around my booth because now they're paying attention that I've said something to them. And that gets them to have a conversation and they feel more open to discuss. Um, there's definitely, you know, as a, as a buyer, uh, just like, you know, when I go on break and travel around Argus Alley, if people are heads down or like talking to their friend or like they're not paying attention or they seem like they don't want to be bothered, I don't want to approach that artist. And I've been doing this for a long time. I'm not shy. And so like you definitely want to make sure that you are willing to sell to the customer because that's why you're there. So make sure that you are paying attention. I've seen a lot of people make this mistake. Totally. Yeah, I've, I've seen people, they'll set up something where they're doing commissions, fan art or something like that. And they, they have a commission list and they just sitting there through the entire convention, just head down painting um, at, their, at their table. And if they've got prints that are upright, they're hidden behind everything. So from a distance, it looks like there's nobody at their booth or at their, at their table. Mm-hmm. And I've seen people have, have rigged mirrors rigged up where like some kind of what? double mirrors. Uh, I swear to you, comic book artists are the worst <laughs> at, at New York Comic Con. They have like a double mirror set up where you can see what they're painting or drawing without them having oh, to look up at you. Wow. And I'm like, dude, why'd you even show up? <laughs> like if you're getting commissions like that, you could do that from home. Like w- what's the point, right? I and and I- think their clients there though, right? I think like, they do, yeah. And, and they can afford to do that. So. It's a different mentality. Yeah. yeah. But it's, so, it's interesting. Yeah. So it's definitely not why I'm there, but yeah. like, I, I get it, but it is, it can be off-putting at some points. It's just like, why, like, why are we here? Um, yeah, to me, it's like, I don't like working at the show. Like, it's already a lot of work to be there emotionally that I'm like, I don't want to be making art also with all these people dr- like watching me draw. It's not what I like to do, but there's a lot of artists that are co- more comfortable drawing instead of interacting with people. So I, I get why they do that. But yeah. I feel like even if they are making a lot of mo- enough money off of commissions, they're po- potentially losing out on new connections if they were more engaging. I think that's probably the point that you're making, Eric, is that mm-hmm. if they would look up every now and then and not just completely ignore everyone, they might catch someone that just saw their art for the first time right. and yeah. attract right. A, new, a new fan base. So, And that's what I you want to do. I've had situations where, and it always happens when I, my feet are throbbing from standing and smiling and nodding at people. And I just want to sit down just for one second and somebody walks up to the table (laughs) because the minute I sit down, I'm hidden behind a wall of prints and then I got to pop up and it scares them. like so, they were not expecting this like six foot black dude to come out like, out of nowhere like, oh, it's like, God. Ah, where'd you come right? from where'd you come from <laughs> but, but um i've also had people like they'll walk past the table and they'll stop and they'll go they'll look at everything and they'll say you painted this is this your art i get those questions you get those did you get that, that? Oh my God. like i know it's not my stuff it's like i'm just watching the booth like what 
Like some people actually wear an enamel pin that says like I'm the artist. I'm the artist. <laughs> That's great. I like but like that. often, but oftentimes like people, you know, like sometimes a friend will watch your table or somebody is sitting right. in and they're not the artist. So I think it's a fair question to ask. Yeah. Um, but I do find also like if a man is sitting next to me, they're more inclined to like ask, like, oh, is the man making this art? It's like, can you tell? It's like this is definitely a woman's art. Come on yeah. now. I don't really hide it. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard other female artists say the same. They'll they'll turn to the husband who's not an artist and be like, "Is this your art?" and just talk to him. He's like, "No, it's her art." It's like, "Come on, women can draw too." What the hell? No, Seriously. No. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, like to your to your point, Eric. Uh, you said you had to stand all day. I specifically set up my booth so that I don't have to stand all day. Um, and like my Gen Con booth was actually like the first time I tried this setup. But usually, I can always sit at my artist alley table because it's a lot to to do. So I set my booth up so I could do both. And I'll share my. Uh, I was gonna say, please show her. That's a picture. <laughs> yeah. So here's um. Let me begin this. Oh, here's mine uh, from Gen Con, and um, and so I made like a little nook where I could fit, <laughs> but I can also stand up, and it's okay that I block this print because it's also right here. So <laughs> yeah, that's genius. Brilliant. So it works perfectly. And then uh, I took advantage of my position too because I was like sitting at the end. So here you can see a little cart of originals that people can flip through while other people are at the front of the table. So I just like made use of the real estate that I had. But um, but yeah, that was one way where I kind of took advantage of my space so that I could be comfortable. <laughs> Cause yeah. like standing is really nice, but you can also sit as long as you're visible, people can see you. Mm -hmm. um, but like this was the first year that I made my table uh, this brightly colored and people would usually come in and be attracted by um, you know, the colors of the display. And then they would see me behind it. And they're like, you're blending in with your art. And so I thought that was pretty funny too. <laughs> Yeah, it's color coordinated. I love it. Yeah, for sure. So that's one technique that you can do if you want to make it um, a little bit easier for you to not have to stand all the time. So Eric, if you want to take that. <laughs> no, that's that is brilliant. I never I never thought about parting the, Part the parting seas. the parting the seas there. Um and if it's going to happen, anybody watching this that is listening and is going to do their first convention, it's going to happen. The minute you take a break to eat something, <laughs> oh, you're going to be mid-chew. Like, oh, this this dry cheeseburger, this dry ham sandwich from the convent, from the Never cantina tastes so good right now. And somebody's going to walk up and go, hey, are you selling prints? And, like, oh. <laughs> and your mouth is full of food and you have to say one second. And, you're like, yeah. and it's a funny, awkward interaction and it always happens every convention without fail. Yep. <laughs> without fail. Like, oh man. But yep. Um, Since we're sharing pictures, do you mind if I share my most recent? Please. Uh, setup? Oh, yeah. Video? So I made a banner for my Alice project, which actually drew a lot more people to it um, because I had one with my name and one for the project. So it made it really clear because that's the other thing, like if your work isn't visibly recognizable characters, it does take, it's harder to draw people over. But yeah, I have my prices just like in one spot over here on the right. Um, and so it's not on every piece and then originals on one side. Um, and so then- clean. A few people had these like iPad, it had this like iPad mailing list sign up. I have this like, uh, what do you call it? This like iPad lock that's like tied to the leg of the table so that nobody can steal it. Oh, nice. <laughs> but basically they can type that's it awesome. in. They can just sign up for my mailing list and it just goes directly to my website on there. Um, but yeah. Uh, so, uh, another thing to point out too, just like, especially when you're starting out um, or just really for anybody, um, you see, so I saw that PayPal like thing that you had over in your uh, booth. Oh yeah. Now that technology has advanced so much where like paying is easier than ever, make it as easy as possible for people to pay for your art. Because now you can literally take a phone out and have a QR code yeah. and they can pay you directly on Venmo or PayPal or Cash App and uh, have as many sales channels avenues as open as possible because some people are like, oh, I don't have Venmo. It's like, okay, that's fine. I have Cash App too. And yeah. like you have your, your QR codes right there for people to just like scan with their phone and uh, nobody has to pull out money or count anything. They can just pay you and the transaction is done. So mm -hmm. ease of payment definitely makes it so that um, it'll be more profitable for you to have that avenue. And that costs you no money to set up. That's all free. Uh, you get a free square reader with um, you know your square account. Um, if you want to get the bigger one, I know that costs money. Uh, I think there's one that has um, the, um, I can't remember what the, the uh, 
like you, t- you tap your credit card yeah. functionality. Yeah. Um, but the tap functionality is available on some that you do pay for. Um, I don't think there's even a need for the big screen that, you know, you see in shops and everything. You can just do fine with that reader. Yeah. Yeah. So I know that was a lot of info, but I really hope that y'all enjoyed this pod, this episode of the podcast. Uh, thank you so much for joining us in the comments uh, and also, oh, sorry, in the chat and in the comments. Uh, please feel free to like and subscribe this episode if you liked what we said. And um, also please feel free to join our uh, Facebook group called the Painted in Color um, Podcast Discussion Group. Um, that is a place where we can actively like talk about these ideas. And if you have questions similar to these that we didn't answer here, please feel free to ask more in that group. And, um, and we will happily answer those in the next episode. But again, we want to intend this as a series. So we want to continue this conversation about conventions because again, a huge topic and a lot to cover. So thank you so much for joining us. We hope you have a great day and we'll see you later. Bye.